Hi, so I'm kind of fascinated by the possibilities of this thing. I mean, we've had it in the car park and we chucked some water in there. And if you want to see it in Little Creek, well, just look up the Japanese stuff. What I'm really interested in is, um, is there a possibility this could actually be used for wave power? So we're going to take this down to the sea and give that a try. But before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit about some of what I think are the important aspects of this. Mostly based on comments that have come up. Um, some things like, oh, you won't get much out of that, or oh, you need a lot of talk, and all sorts of stuff that people have mentioned. So I wanted to talk about why I build these things the way I build them. Because, to my mind, what determines the action of these things is not this bit. This bit on the end, actually, is a question of optimization to me. What's important is this bit here. This bit here is the bit that actually defines the amount of work this thing can do. This thing is a purely mechanical system. It's got a slope, it's going to have a weight at the top, which is the weight of water in this case, and that's going to roll down that slope with a known force. And that amount of force is going to be the work that this can do at its maximum. So the maximum effect that this can possibly have is fixed by things like the properties of the material, the strength it has to carry that weight, the degree of slope that we've put in, how long it is, what volume it's occupying, just because that fixes the weight that's going to roll down that hill. I mean, this is, in concept, no different to having a rock on a hill. If I push a rock up to the top of a hill and roll it down, that rock will give out energy that's equal to the energy it took me to push it up there. The advantage of this is, I didn't have to push the water up there, and Mother Nature did it for me. She made it rain, that rain ran down in rivers, I stick this in a river, and all that work has been done by the environment, and I'm just collecting that work. I don't have to push the rock up the hill. But conceptually, a rock up a hill and this particular generator have no difference whatsoever. They're identical things. So this, for me, is the important bit of it, because this fixes the maximum amount of work that could possibly be done by this device, just by its mechanical attributes and things like its volume, its slope, the speed at which I can get that stuff through there. All of that is what fixes the actual effect that this could possibly have. Well, why is that? Well, what it'll do is this bit here, which is the shaft, It'll turn that shaft with a certain amount of force. When you turn a shaft with a force, that's what torque is. Torque is the amount of force you need to apply to rotate something. So the torque on here is going to be fixed by the properties. So the amount of torque I can get is fixed by the mechanical device. The speed of rotation is also fixed by the amount I can throughput there, the rate at which I can throughput it. So the maximum amount of torque that I can get on that shaft and the speed of that shaft is all related to this bit here and has nothing to do with this bit here. This bit here is about converting that mechanical work into electrical energy. So it's got nothing to do with the amount of work that this can do. It's actually a question of efficiency. If I could use this to convert all of that mechanical work into electrical energy, it would be 100% efficient, and of course I can't do that. Even if I chose the best thing possible, I've still got elements in here where I'm going to get losses. So there's going to be less than 100% efficiency. The thing I stick on here is what's going to determine the efficiency of the machine, not the amount of power it can generate. And that's the thing that actually strikes me all the time. People talk about the whole thing as being it can only generate that much power. And that's actually just not right in my mind. In my mind, that is completely swapped over. They look at this first and almost ignore this. To me, I look at this first and then look at that as an optimization exercise as opposed to being core to what's going on. And I think it's just really a question of what you look at, really. It's how you view this thing. Now, Power, actually, is going to be either strong and slow or fast and weak. Now, that's really an interesting concept if you think about it. And it is something that defined the motorcycle industry in the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s. In Britain, based on our Victorian heritage, I mean, have you seen Victorian engineering? I mean, you get Conrad's as thick as your leg. 
And it was built that way because the material science wasn't that good, so they had to make things big to be strong. Now, of course, we've got great material science and we don't need that anymore. We can make little things that are as strong as the great big things the Victorians were producing. So it's kind of a Victorian hang-up, actually. It's got to be slow, it's got to be strong. And that's the way the British industry made motorcycles for years and they dominated the world market in motorcycles. And then the Japanese came along. And the Japanese get a bad press sometimes. I think they're an incredibly inventive people. And they said to themselves, hang on a sec. Instead of having a slow, lumpy engine thudding away, generating lots of torque to get power, why don't we have a light engine zipping around at Mach 10 on a short stroke and we'll get the same power? And of course that's exactly what happened. And because they were doing that with motorcycle engines, the motorcycles were as good as the British motorcycles, but a hell of a lot cheaper. And so they now dominate the world market in motorcycles because they saw that the damn thing didn't need to be lots of torque and slow. Now, if you're thinking about generation, and you think about a generator, a wind generator, and you think, oh, that needs lots of torque, well, it doesn't. What it is, is that those styles of wind generators are in fixed wind speeds where they turn slowly at the hub. They must turn slowly at the hub because they've got great big blades on them. And so at the tip of those blades, they turn at massive speeds and they really stretch the materials. By the time you get to the hub, of course, you're looking at gear ratios, they're turning quite slow, but they need a lot of torque. And they need a lot of torque because they've got to turn a generator. They only need a lot of torque to turn a generator because they're turning so slowly. Now, what's in here is a bunch of wires and magnets. When we turn something quickly like that, the quicker we turn it, the higher the voltage. It's an application of Faraday's law. If we put a lot of wire in there and turn it through a magnetic field, we get a lot of current. That's just an application of Ampere's law. So we need them big and heavy if they're going to turn slow. So if they're going to turn slow, we need a lot of torque because the thing has to be big and heavy. If it can turn quickly and the thing is light, you don't need a lot of torque to get the thing to turn and to generate the power. Now, of course, there is another side to electrical energy generation. If I plug something directly into my generator, I'm adding to the power requirement because I'm basically putting a load on it and it has to turn the generator and run that load and that puts more work on that head, meaning that head has to have an even stronger torque. But we can dissociate that. We can dissociate that by sticking something like that in it. What this acts like is a sponge. It slowly fills up from the low torque, high spinning to fill it up. And then we draw our power from the capacitors. So the capacitors actually don't affect the generator because they have this bit as an interface between them acting like a kind of sponge. So if you're going to use something like fast spinning with low torque, you need something in between that's going to disassociate the application load from the generator load. So if you look at it slightly differently, that you're not actually got a device that needs high torque, you've got a generator that needs high torque, you're looking at it, I think, the other way around. So if you've got a generator that needs high torque, well, you've got two options. Either change your generator for one that needs low torque and stick in a dissociation device, or create a device that generates high torque. So you don't need, I think, you don't need high torque at the shaft. I think that's a, an old way of looking at things based on Victorian principles. And, and I don't mean that to be an insult, so please don't take it that way. I think that what we need to look at when we're looking at these things is this bit, because this bit's the important bit. This bit obviously has a, a massive effect, but focusing on this means that you then don't look at alternatives here. Focusing on this means that you do look at alternatives here, and I think that's going to be a better thing. Now, because this is a slow-turning, high-torque machine, the torque it can generate at that shaft is actually related more to the weight that you're going to put through it and the turning force on it. And that's going to be a relatively high torque. So this one's not like a wind generator. It's quite slow turning and it has quite high torque. And I've stuck this thing on it. And this thing is obviously a NEMA motor. And a NEMA motor is exactly what I was talking about. It's actually a low torque, fast spinning device. This is completely mismatched. I've got a high torque device 
attached to a low torque generator. I should have done it the other way around, but I don't have a fortune to spend on these things, so I tend to pick up what it is that I've got and give it a go. And the reason I do that is because I'm more interested in what this is going to do. What this is going to do is a different question. The linkage between the two is a question of optimization. So people, if you're focusing on this, you're focusing on the wrong thing, I think. You should be, according to my way of looking at things, focusing on this bit, because this bit is going to fix the amount of energy you can generate. Now that bit, that bit, you can play around with to optimise the highest percentage. Okay, I feel like I've blabbed on enough. Let's go down the seaside and stick it in the sea. Okay, I thought that was awesome, actually. Um, it's showing potential as being a wave generator. I mean, clearly, I did this because I was looking at the Japanese stuff, and so I set it to what the um, Japanese inventor had actually done. I put it at that same angle, really, because I was thinking of the same things. So clearly the angle was wrong. There's clearly other things to think about. Um, we didn't get much on that lapping, did we? I mean, we got like maybe a foot or so, something like that. So the active area was pretty much missed in this top section here. We got the action, sort of that bottom half section. So I've clearly made it far too long for that application, at the wrong angle for that application. And it makes me think as well that the blade diameter was um, far too small. What we need really is a bigger blade diameter so we can take more weight in that smaller movement. Because we effectively remember rolling a rock up a hill. So we need a bigger rock which means you need a bigger blade. But clearly, something like an uh, Archimedes screw could be used for wave generation. I thought it was pretty exciting stuff, so I wanted to share it with you. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thank you very much for watching.